Dearly beloved in the hearts of Jesus and Mary, when Pope Pius XI canonized St. John Hughes on May 31, 1925, he proclaimed him to be the father, the doctor, and the apostle of the devotion to the Holy Heart of Mary and to the Sacred Heart of our Lord. In saying this, Pope Pius XI was only repeating what Pope St. Pius X had said at the time of the beatification of John Hughes in 1909. Before both of these popes, Pope Leo XIII had, in 1903, greatly honored John Hughes by publicly recognizing him to be, as he said, the author of the liturgical worship of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and of the Holy Heart of Mary. We will yet see why St. John Hughes deserves such a high honor. In taking note of the papal recognition given to St. John Hughes, we should also add that Pope Pius XII, in writing his encyclical Haurietis Aquas, on the Sacred Heart of Jesus in 1956, singled out St. John Eudes as the author of the first liturgical office to be celebrated in honor of the most sacred heart of Jesus. The Holy Father said this while naming ten saints who had distinguished themselves in promoting devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The distinction which St. John Hughes possesses in promoting devotion to the hearts of Jesus and Mary is one of the reasons why he was proclaimed to be the wonder of his age by a contemporary of his in the 17th century, that is, by Father Ollier, the saintly founder of the Sulpician Fathers, whose work was the training of young men for the priesthood. If St. John Hughes was truly the wonder of his age, we naturally wonder why it took well over 200 years before he began to be recognized by the popes as such an outstanding apostle of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. But then we must realize that saints not only live during a time when divine providence raises them up for the good of men, but they are also given the supreme honors of the Church at a particular time when such recognition has, in the eyes of God, a special meaning in regard to them. Bearing this in mind, we understand why St. John Hughes has come into his own during this 20th century. It seems only fitting that the Father, the Doctor, and the Apostle of the Devotion to the Holy Heart of Mary and to the Sacred Heart of our Lord, as Pope Pius XI designated him, should come into the limelight during the era when devotion to the hearts of Jesus and Mary has come into full flowering and has gained wide popularity among faithful Catholic people who truly understand the place of those two sacred hearts in the divine plan of salvation. Pope Leo XIII brought devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus to the forefront of Catholic devotions when he consecrated the whole world to the sacred heart in the holy year of 1900. Three years later, in 1903, the last year of his life, Leo XIII declared St. John Hughes to be the author of the liturgical worship of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and of the Holy Heart of Mary. Not long after that, in 1909, St. John Hughes was beatified, and then, in 1925, he was canonized. In the meantime, between his beatification and canonization, devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary began its rise. In 1917, Our Lady revealed the holy will of God in regard to devotion to her Immaculate Heart, with which she appeared exposed under upon her breast in Fatima's Cova de Area. 
Later on, in 1942, Pope Pius XII gave due recognition to these revelations, and he consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Thus it was that St. John Hughes, the Apostle of the Holy Heart of Mary, achieved the glory of the altar during the age of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and rightly so, since he was the first to give the glory of the altar to Mary's heart, for he was the first to observe a liturgical feast in honor of that holy heart. In the years immediately following the 1925 canonization of St. John Eudes, Pope Pius XI wrote two important encyclicals on the Sacred Heart of Jesus, while Pope Pius XII as we have already noted, issued his 1956 encyclical on the Sacred Heart, in which he paid St. John Eudes such a high compliment. And here again we must state that St. John Eudes deserved to be honored during the century when so great honors have been given to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. For it was in honor of the Sacred Heart that St. John Eudes had observed the first liturgical feast, just as he did also in honor of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Added to all this, we cannot omit mentioning the fact that during these years of the glorification of St. John Eudes, the devotion to the sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary was revealed by our Lord to Bertha Petit, who is known as the Apostle of the Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary. It was in 1909, the year of the beatification of St. John Eudes, that Bertha Petit was given the first indication of her divinely chosen mission as the Apostle of the Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary, while it was in the following year, early in 1910, that her mission was clearly revealed to her by our Lord Himself. In the years that followed, until her holy death in 1943, Bertha Petit worked and suffered for the glory of the Heart of Mary, before, during, and after St. John Eudes had attained to the glory of the altar. We should also mention that it was in 1925, the year of the canonization of St. John Eudes, that Our Lady appeared to Sister Lucy of Fatima with her immaculate heart surrounded by piercing thorns while revealing to her the details of the five first Saturday devotion. That was on December the 10th, 1925. The Feast of St. John Eudes has been observed on August the 19th, the day of his death, ever since his canonization. The Holy See made the feast mandatory for the whole Catholic world, with exceptions being made only for those religious orders and those dioceses and parishes which had a special saint or a patronal feast to observe on that day. Now that we have considered St. John Eudes in the light of our own times, we must go back to his own times, the 17th century, to see how God raised up this great apostle of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. St. John Eudes was born in 1601, and he died in 1680. He lived during the period of recovery in the church, after the agonizing and faithful rebellion of the 16th century caused by Luther and King Henry VIII and John Calvin and others. After so many souls were lost to the one and only true Church, Divine Providence raised up saints and other holy persons to bring about a genuine Christian renewal within the Church and to reestablish the holy faith within the hearts of the children of the Church. Some of God's instruments of genuine Christian renewal of faith in the 17th century were St. Francis de Sales, St. Vincent de Paul, 
and St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, not to mention the Jesuit martyrs of North America, as well as the saintly Father Olier, founder of the Sulpicians, whom we have already mentioned, and Cardinal Barul, the saintly founder of the Oratory, to which St. John Hughes belonged until he founded his own religious congregation of Jesus and Mary. And there were various other talented and saintly persons whom God used to spread the holy faith among men in those times. John Hughes was born on November the 14th in the year 1601 near a tiny hamlet called Ree in that part of northwest France which is called Normandy. The Normandy of Lisieux made famous by St. Therese of the Child Jesus two centuries later. Normandy is to the west of Paris and it borders upon the Atlantic Ocean facing the English Channel and England to the northwest. Those who remember some of the details of World War II will know that it was on the sea coast of Normandy that Allied troops landed on D-Day, June 6, 1944, and then the Battle of Normandy developed in the days and weeks that followed. One of the cities in the invasion area, not far from the sea coast, was Cayenne, which St. John Hughes made famous by establishing his headquarters there, and it was there that he died in 1680. During the Allied invasion of 1944, Cayenne, a city of perhaps 70,000 people, was heavily fortified by the Germans, and it was therefore very heavily bombarded, so that much of the city was nothing but rubble. Included in the rubble, sad to say, was the seminary established by St. John Hughes, plus some of the churches of the city. The father of John Hughes was an educated farmer, Isaac Hughes, who was well educated because he had for a time studied for the priesthood and had already received the tonsure, which is the first step to the reception of the holy orders of the priesthood. But circumstances, undoubtedly providential, forced him to discontinue his preparation for the priesthood. The fact is that his whole family was wiped out by a plague. So he returned to the little farm of two acres, which we here in the United States would hardly care to call a farm. At the age of 31, Isaac Hughes married a country girl named Martha Corbin. For the first three years of their married life, Isaac and Martha Hughes were without children, so they turned to heaven and pleaded for the divine blessing of children. It was after a pilgrimage to the sacred shrine called Our Lady of Recovery, not too far from their home village of Re, that they were blessed with their first child, to whom they gave the name John. In his later memoirs, John Hughes attributes his birth to the pilgrimage to Our Lady's Shrine. It was like a heavenly sign of the future mission of St. John Hughes as an apostle of Our Lady's heart. In the years that followed the apparently miraculous birth of John Hughes, his parents were blessed with six more children. One remarkable thing about the prayers of Isaac and Martha Hughes at the Shrine of Our Lady of Recovery was the fact that they promised to offer their first child, if God should bless them with a child, to Our Lord and Our Lady, to Jesus and Mary. And so it turned out that their first child, John, became the founder of the Congregation of Jesus and Mary, popularly called the Yudist Fathers, and he also became the Apostle of the Hearts of Jesus and Mary. 
The prayers of his parents are reminiscent of the prayers of Anna, mother of Samuel the prophet in the Old Testament, who promised God that she would give her child to him if he would only hear her prayer. And St. Joachim and St. Anne also prayed the same way, and God gave them the Blessed Virgin Mary. Of his parents, John Hughes later wrote, God granted me the grace to be born of parents who were in a modest condition of life, who lived in his fear, and who, I have every reason to believe, died in his grace and love. John Hughes received his first Holy Communion at the age of 12, which was considered an early age for First Communion in those days, when the faith was not too strong in Normandy. A year later, he made a private vow of chastity. He was educated at a Jesuit college in Cayenne, 36 miles from home, and it was partially due to the spiritual formation given by the devout Jesuit priests of the college that John Hughes advanced on the road to sanctity. He did not receive the call to become a Jesuit, even though the Society of Jesus was still in its first fervor at that time. Instead, in 1623, at the age of 21, John Hughes joined the oratory of the saintly Peter de Berul, who later became a cardinal, and this oratory, which was located in Paris, under 20 miles to the east, was not technically a religious order or congregation, but rather was an association of secular or diocesan priests who lived together as a community until they were assigned to parishes, and their big aim was to develop a solid spiritual life that would make them truly holy priests and well fitted, therefore, for the guidance of immortal souls. On the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25, 1624, John Hughes, not yet a priest, made a vow of perpetual service to Jesus and Mary, a vow that he would fulfill to the letter in the years to come. The following year he was ordained a priest of God. That was on December the 20th, 1625. In the mysterious designs of God, Father John Hughes became ill not long after his ordination and was forced to spend almost an entire year in what amounted to a private retreat. He was sent by Father de Berul to a village in which there was a shrine of Our Lady called Our Lady of Virtues. It was a great blessing that Father John Hughes was able to spend much time in prayer and meditation in Our Lady's Chapel. After his recovery from illness, Father John responded to a call from his own father who told him of a plague that was spreading in his home area. He was given permission to go help the souls of the dying, administering the sacraments to them and preparing them for death, though he also helped the living to go on living as true Christians. He offered his life to God during this plague, but the Most High did not accept this generous offering. During the period preceding the founding of his own religious congregation, Father John Hughes heroically helped out during another plague in another area, and God again spared his life. And it was also during this period that the holy priest began preaching parish missions. It has been said that he preached well over 106 week parish missions during his priestly life. He had the gift of preaching from God, which included not only eloquence, but also a strong voice, 
added to a heart burning with zeal for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. It was, it was also during his early preaching career that Father John Hughes also began his writing career. He wrote many excellent spiritual books, and he was destined to write books on the hearts of Jesus and Mary, books entitled The Sacred Heart of Jesus and The Admirable Heart of Mary, both of which eventually appeared in English. <coughs> but during his career of preaching parish missions, Father John realized that something was missing in his life. Though he was a very effective preacher of the Word of God and had considerable success in converting souls to God, he saw that after he left a place, the priests did not follow up his zealous work for souls, but remained lax and negligent. So he began thinking of establishing a seminary for the proper training of priests, and he planned to dedicate it to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And at the same time, he saw the need of founding a religious congregation that would be dedicated to conducting seminaries for the training of priests in the true priestly spirit. Thus it came about that he left the Oratorians, with whom he had been associated for about twenty years, <coughs> and on the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25, 1643, and at the shrine of Our Lady of Delivery about eight miles from Cayenne, he formed the congregation of Jesus and Mary together with five other priests. <coughs> This congregation of Jesus and Mary, so often called the Eudist Fathers, was dedicated to two main purposes. To conduct seminaries to train truly religious and uh, Christ-like priests. And secondly, to conduct parish missions for the true Christian renewal of the souls of men. The fact was that in Normandy, as well as elsewhere in those times, priests were poorly trained and were therefore not properly fitted to fulfill their priestly duties. And at the same time, the faith of the people was in a run-down condition because of improper instructions in the faith. Though the country people, and John Hughes was one of them, preserved their faith better than did the city people. Besides founding his congregation of Jesus and Mary, St. John Eudes also founded a religious congregation for women called the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of the Refuge. This was on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in 1641. The main purpose of this religious congregation was to take care of fallen women and delinquent girls. One of the sisters of this congregation, St. Mary Euphrasia Pelletier, canonized by Pope Pius XII in 1940, later on in the 19th century, revised the setup and renamed the congregation as the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, which became well known in the United States also. The great inspiration of St. John Hughes throughout his priestly life was the love of Jesus and Mary, especially as symbolized by their hearts. While preaching in so many places, he plainly saw that real love for God was missing among men, among priests and people. He desired to enkindle that love in the hearts of men, he saw that the perfect external and visible symbol of God's love for men was the sacred heart of Jesus, and he wished to set that symbol before men so that in seeing it they would be inflamed with love for God 
in a more effective way than just by listening to words being spoken about God's love for men. He learned to use the expression sacred heart from the writings of St. Gertrude, the 13th century German Benedictine nun who has been given credit for originating this uh, expression, sacred heart. St. John, you'd like to view the Sacred Heart of Jesus under three different aspects so as to give a full picture of the mystery of the Sacred Heart. To quote his own words, we find his explanation given as follows. In the God-man, we adore three hearts, which are but one and the same heart. The first heart of the God-man is his bodily heart, which is deified, even as are all the other parts of his sacred body, by the hypostatic union which they have with the person of the eternal word. The second heart is his spiritual heart, that is, the superior part of his holy soul, which includes his memory, his understanding, and his will. And the third heart is his divine heart. With an explanation such as this, St. John Yud shows what a profound understanding he had of the mystery of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But another remarkable thing is his emphasis on the unity of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. We have spoken before more than once about this unity of those sacred hearts. Thus, for example, Our Lady revealed to St. Bridget of Sweden in the 14th century that the world was redeemed, as it were, by one heart, that is, the united hearts of Jesus and Mary. Then, in our own times, our Lord revealed this same divine mystery to Bertha Petit. Among other things, our Lord said that the wounded heart of Mary is transfixed by the wound of my heart. St. John Hughes of the 17th century was very clear about this union of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Thus he said, God has so closely united those two hearts that one can say with, uh, with truth that they are only one heart because they have always been animated with the same spirit and filled with the same sentiments and affections. <clears throat> John Hughes was so impressed with the fact of the unity of the hearts of Jesus and Mary that he actually used the expression sacred heart of Jesus and Mary. Not just the plural sacred hearts, but the singular Sacred Heart, Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary. In this connection, it is remarkable to note that pictures of St. John Hughes show him holding a heart in his hand, not two hearts, but one heart. This shows clearly, very clearly, the unity of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. So intimate a union of two hearts that it is as if they were but one heart. St. John Hughes could not rest satisfied with a merely personal devotion to the hearts of Jesus and Mary, nor only with promoting this devotion among others. He ardently wished to see the hearts of Jesus and Mary honored in the sacred liturgy through the establishment of feasts in honor of those two sacred hearts. It was the successful promotion of this purpose that eventually earned him the title of author of the liturgical worship of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and of the Holy Heart of Mary, a title given to him by Pope Leo XIII. And Pope St. Pius X later stated that St. John Hughes was divinely inspired 
in promoting the liturgical worship of those sacred hearts. One might think it rather strange that St. John Eudes worked for the establishment of a feast in honor of the heart of Mary first, before working for the institution of a feast in honor of the heart of Jesus. The fact is that St. John believed that France was better prepared to accept a feast in honor of Our Lady's heart, and besides, this can be considered to be in accord with the old principle of to Jesus through Mary. Already as early as 1641, St. John Hughes began composing the text for a mass in honor of Mary's heart, as well as the divine office for her feast. But he needed permission from the bishop to be allowed to celebrate a feast in honor of Mary's heart and to use the text of the Mass which he had composed. To his great joy he received this permission the very year that he founded his Congregation of Jesus and Mary. The first liturgical feast in honor of the heart of Mary was celebrated on October the 20th in the year 1643. This was done in a rather private manner in the community chapel of St. John's new congregation, but it was done with formal approval of the proper ecclesiastical authority, and it paved the way for the eventual extension of the Feast of Mary's Heart to the entire Catholic world. St. John Hughes never used the word immaculate in connection with Mary's heart. That was to come later by divine inspiration and after the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. The most common term used by St. John Hughes was admirable, the admirable heart of Mary. It was only almost 20 years later that St. John Hughes succeeded in obtaining ecclesiastical permission for a feast in honor of the sacred heart of Jesus for which he himself composed the text of the Mass and the Divine Office. The first feast of the sacred heart of Jesus was celebrated on October the 20th in the year 1672. And then, in the following year, in 1673, and on the feast of St. John the Evangelist, December 27th, the Sacred Heart appeared for the first time to the 26-year-old St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, who is often looked upon as the greatest of the Apostles of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But great as is the glory of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, it cannot dim the well-deserved glory of St. John Hughes, the father, the doctor, and the apostle of the devotion to the Holy Heart of Mary and to the Sacred Heart of our Lord, as Pope Pius XI called him, and the author of the liturgical worship of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and of the Holy Heart of Mary, as Pope Leo XIII honored him. May the Lord bless you and give you peace.